Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. It's a letter no parent wants to receive. A Northeast ISD high school sent a, out a letter informing parents about a man who tried to get a student who was waiting for the bus to get inside his truck. Yeah, the incident happened near the bus stop near Encino Park Elementary School. The night team's Tiffany Huerta spoke to concerned parents. I was shocked. Yeah, it was very scary. The principal of Johnson High School sent this letter to parents today. It says a parent reported that her daughter was waiting for the school bus yesterday near Caliza and Encino View when a man in a black pickup truck pulled up next to her and tried to get her to go with him. The student ignored the man. Another driver saw what happened and checked on the student and the man drove off. This all happened near David Erler's home. When I came home, I saw an officer and multiple uh, multiple places around the neighborhood, so I knew something was up. The letter says the Northeast Police Department is investigating along with SAPD. I walked my son to the local elementary school here, and uh, at one point they'll go to the middle school over here, and you know you always think, are you going to let them walk to school? At what point do you trust them? But on the back of your mind, it's always on your head, what if somebody tries to take them? Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. A retired San Antonio police detective caught on camera pulling a gun on a man in the middle of a parking lo parking lot. Tonight, San Antonio police are explaining why the case remains open more than a week after the encounter. This is video the victim recorded on his own cell phone. SAPD identified the man with the gun as retired detective John Schiller. The confrontation happened at a Home Depot near Culebra and Loop 1604. Schiller told police he showed up at the store once his ex-wife told him the victim found her cell phone on the street and refused to return it. The victim, who asked that we not identify him, told KSAT and police he planned to return the phone after running an errand. San Antonio police say the lead detective hasn't been able to make contact with the victim and can't move forward with the investigation until they get a statement from him. A statement from SAPD released tonight says in part, quote, we do not condone any preferential treatment and will do our due diligence in the in the cases we handle, no matter the suspect, end quote. The victim says he is hoping to provide his formal statement Monday morning with his attorney present. Schiller has not responded to our phone calls. Let's take a look at the latest numbers for the pandemic here at home. Our seven day average saw another slight rise. We're at 144, which is an increase of 10 since yesterday. We did see a dramatic drop in hospitalizations tonight. 185 COVID-19 patients are in the hospital tonight, 80 of them in the ICU and 36 on ventilators. The coronavirus is still proving to be as deadly as three new deaths were confirmed today. It's not just more students heading back to class for teachers with San Antonio ISD. The district notified those who were working from home must return to campuses next week. Two teachers tell the night team Stephen Cavazos that they're worried for their lives. Never thought I'd have to make a decision between teaching and my life. Catherine Brendel has been a second grade teacher at Highland Hills Elementary School for five years. She's been teaching from home since March. Brendel says she filed a request with San Antonio ISD over the summer to continue teaching remotely. This week, Metro Health announced the risk level for schools is now low and more students can return to class as long as CDC guidelines are followed. Brendel says she has an underlying medical condition and returning to class puts her life at risk. I've maintained a meticulous bubble. And as soon as I go in my classroom, I pop it. The district says the end date for all accommodations is today, and teachers are expected to return on Tuesday. Brendel had filed a request on October 1st to extend her remote teaching, but says she has yet to receive an answer. I can't go back to campus. SAISD tells us it has received about 125 work modification requests from teachers and are carefully reviewing each of them. Claire Romano is in a similar situation. I think anyone would feel nervous in put in that position of not knowing um, and your safety and health is on the line. Romano is a teacher at Steel Montessori Academy. She says she also has health conditions, but she still doesn't know if she will have to be back in class by next week. She hopes the school district is listening. My life is at risk going into a classroom where COVID is still out there. Brendel agrees and hopes the right decision is made. We just have got to be still and wait. 
and that saves lives. Stephen Cavasso's KSAT 12 News. Metro Health says schools can welcome back 10 to 20 students now that the risk level is low. However, they said it should be students who would benefit the most from in-person learning and depends on the size of the classroom and district's decision. SAISD says that they are offering as much flexibility as possible and are carefully balancing campus and staff needs. Tonight, KSAT brought you the debate for Texas Congressional District 23. Tony Gonzalez and Gina Ortiz Jones faced off in Uvalde tonight as our own Steve Spreester moderated the debate. Several questions were brought to the two candidates, including where they live. Both spoke about ties to San Antonio and their military service. But there were also issues like health care each candidate faced, all surrounding the Affordable Care Act or ACA. I want to make sure that everyone has access to the same quality care that my mom did, allowed her to beat cancer and be with us today. And again, this comes down to people having access to quality, affordable health care. That's why I support protecting and expanding the ACA and including a public option. My opponent wants to, wants to eliminate the ACA and its protections for people with pre-existing conditions. Um, coronavirus survivors, uh, cancer survivors like my mom, folks with diabetes, folks with asthma. Do you support the Supreme Court through overthrowing the Affair Affordable Care Act. I support the next version of the Affordable Care Act to have pre-existing conditions embedded in it. I believe in increased funding for community health centers. I believe in ensuring private practices have are protected against from lawsuits. Tonight's debate also took the coronavirus into account. As our Steve Spreester reports, tonight was about politics through the plexiglass. It is a district that has 29 counties and two people who have never held elected office before want to be the next congressional representative for Texas District 23. It was held here on this stage at Southwest Texas Junior College with a big eight foot by 12 foot plexiglass wall in between these candidates. Gina Ortiz Jones and Tony Gonzalez seem to hold their own. They have very different visions for what they want to see for the future of Texas District 23 and both of them seem to make their points and address some of the most controversial charges that they've had against each other as this campaign has played out. And with just five days left before early voting, both of them were clearly making a pitch to the voters of this county that goes, this district rather, that goes all the way from the edge of San Antonio to the border and west to El Paso. Who won tonight's debate? Ultimately, that's up to the voters to decide and we'll find out on November 3rd. In Uvalde, Steve Spreester, KSAT 12 News. And right now on KSAT.com, several preparations underway ahead of the election. Plexiglass, disinfecting wipes, and voting machines were set up inside the AT&T Center. It's one of hundreds of Election Day voting sites. There's a smaller list of early voting polling sites, which will open on Tuesday. We also have information on curbside voting available for a specific group of voters. It's all online at KSAT.com. Well, the second presidential debate is likely to not happen. It was slated to happen on Wednesday. But following the president's COVID-19 diagnosis, the Commission on Presidential Debates transitioned the debate from in-person to virtual. But President Donald Trump said that he would not participate. Vice President Joe Biden is now slated to participate in a town hall on October 15th, instead hosted by ABC News. Other top stories tonight, police searching for 10 suspects after a shooting at Boulder Creek Apartments. The complex is on Vance Jackson near Hebner Road. Officers say it began with some sort of a disturbance at the apartment. After people ran from that apartment, investigators say several armed individuals were involved in a shootout in the parking lot and throughout the complex. Two men were injured and several cars were riddled with bullets. One stray bullet also ended up inside of an apartment, but no one was injured. Well, two 13-year-olds now facing murder charges. Both teens arrested after Rene Rodriguez Jr. was shot while he was sleeping at a home on Lasses Boulevard yesterday. Police had been looking for Rodriguez's sister and the gunman, both believed to be dating. Because the two teens arrested are minors, police are not releasing their identities. 
Two off-duty Bear County Precinct 2 deputy constables injured when a suspected drunk driver hit them in Austin. The two constables involved are identified as Leticia Martinez and Alfred Alcatar. The crash happened while the constables were working traffic control in a construction zone this week. The suspect, 25-year-old Charles Duffield, is accused of driving up to 120 miles per hour when he hit another vehicle that spun out of control, hitting the two deputies. Deputy Martinez suffered a broken leg, and Deputy Alcatar's foot was crushed. Duffield now charged with intoxication assault of a peace officer. Still ahead on the night beat, the pandemic numbers in the U.S. moving in the right direction. The economic toll it's taking and what the candidates for president are now saying. And we take the coronavirus questions to the experts. Dr. Ruth Bergeron joining us live for our KSAC Q&A later on in this newscast. And they are symbols for Day of the Dead. How Texans can play a part in the survival of the monarch butterflies. It's next. I'm back in my kitchen for another easy recipe that you can make at home. This week we're doing a fall classic pumpkin bread that's coming up tomorrow on GMSA. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather streaming free on KSAT TV. The monarch butterflies hold a special meaning in Mexico. As we told you yesterday, the monarchs begin to appear in Mexico around Day of the Dead and are believed to hold the spirits of lost loved ones. But their population is slowly dwindling. Tonight, we head inside the butterfly reserve near Macheros, Mexico, and see how Texans can play a part in their survival. I guess it's the whole experience. I usually say that pictures and videos can capture all of these things. It's like, it's, I guess it's more about the, the feelings that you have when you are up there in the reserve. Cerro Pelon is home to millions of monarchs. The butterflies begin their yearly migration in Canada, pass through the U.S., then begin to appear in Mexico around the same time as Day of the Dead, taking up habitat in the sacred Oyamel trees outside of Mexico City. And we don't know why the butterflies, they come to the same uh, trees here in Cerro Pelon and even in the other places of Rosario and Sierra Chinqua and the ones that opens to the public, uh, they go into the same, uh, same trees, you know. And when they arrive here in Cerro Pelon, uh, they arrive uh, really, really high. But they do it every year, you know. It is that yearly migration that fascinates scientists. And areas like Texas play an especially important role. Well, we've been seeing more butterflies this year and last year. Last year, we definitely, because the weather was finally better in Texas, Texas is super, you know, what, whatever happens in Texas is super important for the eastern monarch migration, that the droughts ended, that there were more wildflowers. The population really kind of rebounded last year. Despite this, the monarchs are believed to be in danger. Conservationists noting the population as a whole has experienced a decline in recent years, the drop attributed to factors such as climate climate, pesticides, and development. Well, in, like 2013 was the lowest count ever, I believe, like everywhere. And for us at Point Pelee, we didn't even do the count that year. There was, it was so low. Darlene Burgess, who traveled here from Canada, says there are things people, especially Texans, can do to help the monarchs survive. Plant milkweed, preferably native, whatever is native to your area, and provide nectar plants. They build their nectar as a caterpillar and as an adult coming through all the way south through Texas, everywhere. And so nectar plants, because it's just as important as, as the milkweed. As for this year's population in Cerro Pelon, it was healthy and robust much to the amazement of visitors. First of all, the monarchs, you know, they're the kings, right? You know, like they're royalty. They're just so beautiful, and there's such a beautiful contrast with their orange against the green, and then just, you know, them fluttering by, and it's just, yeah, it's just beautiful. A sight to behold and protect for generations to come. 
By the way, here locally, the annual Monarch Butterfly and Pollinator Festival is tagging and releasing monarchs in honor of those lost, those lives lost. To learn more about their initiative, we have a link under this story on our website, ksat.com. And of course, don't forget, KSAT will be hosting our Day of the Dead virtual event October 30th at 8 p.m. Cannot wait for that. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we have good weather, but we did have some good yes. weather today. We actually had some clouds out there too. Uh, they came in from Hurricane Delta. So those came in and basically parked over the I-35 corridor earlier today. Let's talk about our weather headlines. A lot to talk about here going forward. Hurricane Delta in the Gulf, Category 3 storm. Now, once that's all out of here and inland and dissipating, the heat is going to build behind that storm. And we're looking at record challenging heat as we get into the weekend. Actually, I do think we will be breaking at least a record or two. All right, let's take a look at our radar over the past three hours. A little bit of activity from Delta, the outermost bands cycling on shore. Few showers out there, especially in DeWitt County. Earlier this evening, it is since dissipated other than a little sprinkle out there, but that's it. And we're going to be hard pressed to see much rainfall from this, even along the coastal plain. There will be a few more showers tonight and into tomorrow, but overall, the rain is going to be far east Texas and up through Louisiana, of course, as this system will be headed northward. So here's the latest look at it as it just started its turn a little bit to the right from its previous path. And by the way, notice how the hurricane hunters are flying out of San Antonio right now. They're typically based out of Biloxi at Keesler Air Force Base, but they left there because they were roughly in the path of the storm moved to JBSA Lackland, and that's where they're doing their operations out of. So welcome hurricane hunters. Welcome to San Antonio, and thanks for all the incredible work that you do for taking those measurements inside the storms that are so critical for forecasting and figuring out where these are going to go. So their latest information tells us that max sustained winds are 120 miles per hour, gusting up to 150. Pre central pressure right now at 955 millibars, moving to the north northwest. Now let's go through time here. I hate it when my computer does this. Hold on, just give it a five count and it's going to populate the, the path here. It, there we go. See, it does that every so often. There it is. It gets paused up sometimes. So this will likely make landfall as a category three, category two by Friday evening. Okay, roughly around sunset and then push northward through Louisiana and dissipate as it moves into northern Mississippi and western Tennessee. So this system luckily is going to be progressive. It's not going to just move in and sit in one spot. So that will limit the rainfall a little bit. Nonetheless, it's still going to dump a lot of rain. We're talking about a big swath right through Louisiana, especially Lake Charles area northward through Alexandria of five to 10 inches and localized amounts of 12 to 15. And keep in mind, that's all that rain on a part of Louisiana, especially Lake Charles area that is still recovering from Laura. There's still a lot of blue tarps covering roofs. There's debris scattered all over the place still. So it's, it's a situation that's not ideal, especially when you're still trying to recover from Laura. So very unfortunate in terms of the uh, location of that back to back hurricanes there. 60 degrees this morning. That was our low 89 was our high temperature right now. We're at 78 temperatures not falling off as quickly this evening as the past couple of nights. Dew point is 68 by the way. So some humidity in the air for sure. Castroville's at 80 77 Helotus. Bulverde right now at 73 and Canyon Lake at 76. By and large, we're in the 70s. And tomorrow morning, I think we'll wake up to temperatures right near 70, then into the upper 80s in the afternoon. A mixture of sun and clouds. We'll have some cloud bands thrown our way from Delta. And there's also that slight chance of a few showers, mainly east of San Antonio. Along the coastal plain, we're talking Lavaca County, DeWitt County, Carnes County, Goliad, and even Victoria counties and then right along the coastline. You'll have a few showers cycle through. The rest of us, we'd be lucky to see any drops from this, even along the I-35 corridor. Okay, behind Delta, I mentioned the heat is going to build. It's going to be summer like this weekend. I know a lot of uh, swimming pools, the water temps a little chilly now. That might actually feel refreshing. Mm. Saturday 94, Sunday 98, and that would set a record for the day. Nothing but sunshine over the weekend. Thank you, Adam.
All right, Greg, so it is Thursday, and for the second week, we've got some high school football. Yeah, we're getting back at some semblance of normalcy here with big game coverage now on Thursday night as well. We still have some schools out, but we have enough for four big games tonight. So we've got the highlights to show you on that. And the Dallas Cowboys are thinking about shutting down their big left tackle coming up. Thursday night football is back for a second week with a big district showdown 29 6 8 between the Stevens Falcons and the Warren Warriors. Into the first quarter, Warren is on the move. Vaughn Martinez, quick pass here to Ian Garo on the wide receiver screen. And we look at this. He cuts to the inside, then he is off to the races. It looks like he's going to score, but he starts to stumble around the 15 and brought down at the four, but not before picking up 42 big yards. Second quarter now, we switch sides. Warren on the goal line now. The pitch goes to Pelham Turner, who plunges in for the score. 7 0 Warren. The final from Ferris there, 45 14. Stevens with a big win. Off we go to Gustafson Stadium. Churchill Chargers took on the Jay Mustangs. Churchill inside the J-15. Running back Michael Dottie burst up the middle for the 14-yard touchdown to push the Chargers out to a 35-0 lead. But that's when the Mustangs finally get on the board. Xerdurin Huerta gets to the outside, into the end zone, 19 yards out. The final from Gus, 38-21, Churchill. Veterans Memorial hosting Modena Valley. Rutledge Stadium in Converse tonight. Non-district showdown. The Patriots down 3-0 early, but they fight back. Inside the Panthers 10, J.C. Solitaire takes a hand up, breaks to the outside, gets in the end zone untouched. They would miss the extra point, 63 Patriots. And the final from Converse, 38-10, Veterans Memorial. Now we go to Southwest Legacy. The Floresville Tigers come calling on the Titans, and we're tied at 13 on the third. Cesar Tovar rolls to his right, goes deep down the sideline to Javier Murillo, who gets pushed out at the five-yard line. That's a gain of 37 yards. Two plays later, Desmond Soares caps off the drive with a five-yard TD. They miss the extra point to make it 19-13 Titans. Final from Southwest Legacy. Titans with the big win, 40-39, to hanging on for that victory. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The Dallas Cowboys are considering shutting down All-Pro and Pro Bowl left tackle Tyron Smith for the rest of the season. That's because his neck issues have flared up again after playing last week, and the recovery this week is not going well. In fact, he's getting second and opinions from doctors today, according to the NFL Network. Once arguably the best offensive line in the league has been devastated by injuries, beginning with Travis Frederick's retirement, followed by Leo Collins' season-ending hip surgery, Joe Looney's knee injury, and now this. The game against the winless Giants is a must-win for the Cowboys. They've started 1-3. and three. It also marks the first time the Cowboys have played against their former coach Jason Garrett since he was fired last January, hired by the Giants as an offensive coordinator. We are very thankful for uh, our time with Coach Garrett. Uh, we're thankful for what he's done, uh, did for us, you know, in the past. But uh, I mean, right now we're just we're focused on getting better as a team this year and uh, and going to win a football game. Nothing but respect for Coach Garrett, uh, and it'll be great to see him. But I think you said it best. Uh, this is about uh, getting a win. All right, kickoff on Sunday, set for 325. The Cowboys are nine-point favorites. Meantime, the Houston Texans will be six-point favorites when they host the Jacksonville Jaguars at noon at NRG Stadium. Be the first game for Romeo Cornell as the Texans' interim coach after Bill O'Brien was fired on Monday as both the head coach and general manager. At 73 years of age, Cornell, who has been a head coach with both the Browns and the Chiefs in his 50 years of coaching, becomes the oldest coach in NFL history to take the field this weekend. And with Deshaun Watson as their quarterback, the duo becomes the first black head coach and black quarterback combo in the history of the franchise. I didn't, I didn't even know that. Uh, that's pretty dope. That's pretty cool. Uh, history is, you know, is, is going to continue to grow, especially with the times going on right now. But, uh, you know, me and, me and Rag, what we want to do is make sure that this, this team and this, that locker room is focused and ready to go win on Sunday. Do the Astros events of the American League Championship Series next. After suffering their first loss of the season, the UTSA Roadrunners have another tall task this weekend trying to beat 15th ranked and undefeated BYU on the road. This will be their first meeting ever between UTSA and BYU after the Cougars were a last second add to the Roadrunners schedule due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Cougars boast the number one offense in the nation with over 585 yards and number one defense allowing only 214. The Roadrunners are coming off a 21-13 loss to UAB where they lost quarterback Josh Atkins to a broken collarbone for the next four to six weeks. But they may have their starter, Frank Harris, back after he suffered a knee injury in the first half against Middle Tennessee. See, but what have the conversation been like with Coach Trailer about his playing status? I, I told him, Coach, I mean, you're going to have to make that call. I'm going to tell you I'm good every time. Uh, so, I, I mean, I'm going to always say I'm good no matter what the, the circumstances are. Uh, I basically told him that. Uh, he told me I can't even tell him that. I got to tell him the truth. Uh, so, like I said, he made that call last week. I told him I was good. Uh, he kind of looked at me, seen what I could do. Uh, I was kind of limping. He was like, yeah, that's you're, you're a no-go. So, uh like I said, I respect him for that. 
because there's other me I'd have been playing last game. Harris and Lowell Narcisse have been sharing snaps during practice this week, with Harris officially listed as a game time decision. ALDS game four this afternoon with a win. The Astros advance to the ALCS, but they had fall in a 3 nothing hole early. The Astros bats come alive with the fourth. Michael Brantley, two-run shot to the seats and right. Houston down one. Carlos Correa, a three-run shot, puts Houston out in front. The Astros will go on to score six more runs over the next three innings to punch their ticket to their fourth straight American League Championship Series, 11-6. to six. And a shout-out tonight to the Seguin's Lions Club for asking me out, and also to Seguin head coach, their football head coach, Travis Bush, for giving me a tour of the brand-new Matter door stadium it is a wonderful facility now and thanks to the superintendent out there and the people of Seguin for getting the job done for the kids all right awesome thank you greg got it we'll be right back all right welcome back tonight we are joined by dr ruth bergeren from the long school of medicine good evening dr bergeren and thanks for joining us again we spoke to you earlier at six o'clock this evening, but we didn't get a chance to speak about the CDC revised guidance on airborne transmission. Could you just touch on that topic a bit for us? Right, so we've been hearing all along that this is uh, spread by respiratory droplets, and, and that is the case. The thing is um, that it's possible that some of these droplets are smaller, that they hang out in the air longer as the, part of the, the water droplet dries out, and they can linger, and they, that means the viruses can travel farther than six feet, and they can stick around maybe for hours. And so there's been a, a number of cases where it's pretty clear that people transmitted COVID, and they transmitted it farther than six feet away, and, and that it, it must have lingered in the air for a period of time. So what this means for us is that we should be careful about air exchange, making sure that there's good quality air exchange going on in our buildings. It also is a reminder that in just whatever you can do to increase the ventilation, even if it's opening up a window, is very, very helpful. They stopped short of telling us to go and change our uh, HVAC systems or giving us a specific kind of filter to get for our air, but it's a reminder that quality ventilation is important and you should pay attention to it. Make sure that you're increasing the air exchanges in your buildings. Dr. Berger, we know COVID is a virus. We know it's obviously contagious, but at what point does someone necessarily stop being contagious? Does that necessarily line up with symptoms ending or the disappearance of symptoms? So um, most people will not be contagious after seven days. However, if you keep testing them or if they keep going to get tests, they're going to find viral particles in their noses and those viruses are not able to be cultured. And we know this from careful scientific studies and we've known it for quite some time. Uh, it's a bit puzzling because some people do seem to have evidence of the virus in their nasal passages out to beyond 30 days to even 60 days. But so far, nobody has shed virus uh, beyond 90 days. So 90 days is the cutoff. If you've had COVID or if you tested positive for COVID, don't get tested again until at least 90 days have elapsed and then only go get tested if you've had an exposure or if you have symptoms. Uh, we're seeing lots of people getting multiple tests and then being puzzled, you know, that they tested negative and then they tested positive again. And what does this mean? And it's been 60 days. Stop worrying about it. Um, we can we can see this shedding, but you're not contagious um, after that period of time. The guidelines haven't changed at all. And if you've gotten sick, you want to stay in isolation for 10 days and then you need to be asymptomatic or you have to have resolution of your fever for 24 hours before you can come out of isolation. Those, that has not changed. And Dr. Bergeron, going to the uh, Regeneron cocktail that President Donald Trump received, we saw that he received the cocktail and then went back to the Oval Office. Should we be feeling confident that this cocktail is a miracle drug that could work? And if so, how soon could we see it available to the public? Well, it's not a miracle drug, but it's definitely in advance. And I just want to remind people before I dive into the Regeneron that uh, President Trump also got the antiviral remdesivir and he also got dexamethasone, the steroid. But remdesivir is um, 
excuse me, Regeneron's uh, monoclonal antibody is a protein, it's a combination of a couple of them, that bind to the coronavirus's spike protein, which then block the coronavirus from entering your cells. And when it's been studied in humans, and hundreds of people have got it, gotten it so far, um, we find that the level of virus in the body goes down rather quickly. And so uh, we expect that um, symptoms will resolve sooner uh, and that we will ultimately see improvements in survival. But the prolonged studies have not been completed for us to be able to say that this drug saves lives. We know that it's been tolerated, it's been very safe, and we know how it works, and we know that it reduces virus in a person's body. I think it's a fantastic advance. I'm, I'm expecting that we will see it um, under an emergency use not long from now. Flu season is upon us. What would you say to the folks who say, I'm gonna skip it this year, I'm going out less, I don't have to get one. What would you say to those folks? Not the year to skip it. Uh, you wanna avoid getting uh, flu on top of COVID that could really be lethal. And even if you get mild flu, you're not gonna know if it's flu or COVID and you're gonna go and get tested um, and you're gonna you know, be exposed to other people, you're gonna use up tests. And so uh, we urge everybody to please get their flu shot. I've had mine, it was not bad at all. I had a sore arm for about one evening. Um, and it's, it's really a small thing you can do. It won't prevent you from getting COVID, but it'll keep you from getting sick and thinking you have COVID and it'll keep you out of the emergency room. So it's a good thing to do. Don't forget to do it before you vote and then get out and vote and vote <laughs> early. Okay. And speaking of voting, we are hearing um, some advances in the way people are gonna be able to vote, some curbside voting options. Is that a safe alternative to going into the polls? What do you think about that? So um, curbside voting is an option for people that have a disability that causes it them to have a physical problem while walking into the poll site. What we want people to know is that don't go curbside if you're feeling ill. If you have symptoms of COVID, do not use curbside. At the end of the day, the election officials have to get fairly close um, through the car window to the faces of people that are doing curbside, and that can put them in jeopardy. And it also brings you, the voter, in close proximity to another human being. And so you, you don't wanna do that un unless you're pretty healthy. So there's nothing wrong with curbside voting in and of itself. It has to be done carefully like all the other things that we talk about. Dr. Ruth Bergren with uh, UT Health's Long School of Medicine. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much. All right, we'll Happy be right to be back. with you. Have a good night. Good night. All right, we'll be right back. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. COVID hospitalizations are now rising in 35 states with the U.S. death toll from the virus exceeding 212,000 tonight. Meanwhile, the White House physician saying President Donald Trump could get back to his public events as soon as Saturday. ABC's Elizabeth Schulze in Washington with the latest. After months of mask wearing, business closures and working from home, the pandemic numbers in the U.S. moving in the wrong direction. 28 states seeing a rise in coronavirus cases and 35 states reporting an increase in hospitalizations. In Wisconsin, this 530-bed field hospital set to open next week. Every region in Wisconsin has hospitals reporting current and imminent staffing shortages. The economic toll accumulating too. Seven months into the pandemic, more than 25 million people are still receiving jobless aid, an additional 840,000 Americans filing for unemployment benefits last week. On the campaign trail in Arizona, Joe Biden blaming President Trump for the grim data. Look, we've paid too high a price already for Donald Trump's chaotic, divisive leadership. <clears throat> More than 210,000 Americans have lost their lives. In a short memo Thursday night, the White House physician Dr. Sean Conley saying he fully anticipates President Trump to return to public engagements by this Saturday. Dr. Conley has repeatedly evaded specific questions about the president's condition before and falsely claimed over the weekend Trump had not received supplemental oxygen when in fact he had twice. The president, who medical experts say is likely still infectious and should be in isolation according to CDC guidelines, 
working again from the Oval Office and refusing to participate in a virtual debate against Joe Biden. The Trump campaign insisting the president can attend the originally scheduled debate in Miami next week in person. Biden now set to participate in an ABC News town hall in Philadelphia next week instead of that debate. And in the race for a COVID-19 vaccine, the Secretary of the Health and Human Services Department said today he expects every American who wants a vaccine will be able to get one by April of next year. Elizabeth Schulz, ABC News, Washington. All right, let's take a live look right now with live cam. 78 degrees out there right now. Yeah, and it looks like some of that cloudiness from earlier is sticking around. Yeah, we'll have some of it through tomorrow. The clouds will be coming and going as a result of Hurricane Delta. It'll throw some of the outermost cloud bands our way, but no big effects from that storm around here, even for most of Texas. The aquifer down just a little bit today to 660.3. As for the pollen count, remember, it's still ragweed season. It's moderate at 160 mold and pigweed, both on the low end. All right, let's take a look at the radar over the past four hours, and we had a few showers cycle their way on shore and make it into parts of the KSAT 12 viewing area, especially DeWitt County dissipating as it moved into Gonzales County, Victoria, Goliad, and you'll see a few more of these passing showers throughout the day tomorrow. Don't anticipate a lot of accumulation, very minimal, but the very outskirts of Delta will be throwing some showers our way. And you can see some of those clouds as well. As I mentioned earlier, welcome hurricane hunters. They're doing their operations here out of San Antonio, out of JBSA Lackland. So they're flying into Delta as they always do all these tropical cyclones. And they've been gathering the very valuable information. They were out there uh, this evening and well earlier this afternoon into the evening. And they brought us our data winds 120 miles per hour. Cat 3 storm gusts up to 150 central pressure at 955 millibars and it's starting to move a little more northerly. It's starting to take a little bit of a right turn, which would steer it away from Texas, of course, and we're still expecting this landfall Friday evening around sunset, give or take basically along the western Louisiana coastline as a category three, maybe a category two storm. It's hard to tell. It's probably going to be borderline two or three and then move northward and of course interacting with land and dissipating very quickly and that's where the swath of rain is going to be right up through Louisiana flooding is going to be an issue storm surge potentially 7 to 11 feet on that front right quadrant where it really pushes that water on shore. Now I mentioned earlier that this is the same area that really got affected by cat Four hurricane Laura in late August. You look at their two paths, the historical path of Delta here and Laura's just to the north of it, they the paths basically paralleled each other and then come landfall converging basically on the same spot. So very similar landfall to what we had with Laura. Just likely the winds aren't going to be quite as high. But keep in mind, this is a part of Louisiana that's still trying to clean up and recover. There are blue tarps over many roofs still. OK, they're still trying to clean up and recover and then this has to move in. So unfortunate situation as for us, 20 percent chance of rain tomorrow. That's going to mainly be east of San Antonio and then yeah, really little to no rain chances beyond then. So pretty much a dry extended forecast again. But look at temperatures. We're going to see the heat build behind Delta. So upper 80s tomorrow. Yeah, more of the same, right? Saturday into the 90s, Sunday, we're going to be flirting with triple digits right near the century mark, and that's likely going to break a record. I mean, 98 is our forecast. That'd be a record by two degrees. Wouldn't shock me if we hit 100, especially uh, just south of San Antonio and closer to the Rio Grande. And then next week, temperatures will moderate downward just a little bit. But again, shout out to the hurricane hunters doing operations out of San Antonio. Thanks for all your work. And thank you, Adam. All right, still ahead. Bear County is known to have high rates of HIV. A new report from the CDC is looking into the infection rates and finding a concern when it comes to the care some may not be receiving. Plus battery phone cases and ceiling fans, just some of the products now under recall. We have the full roundup coming up. But first, health officials monitoring a COVID-19 outbreak at a Walmart. The case coming from a similar outbreak just months earlier. That's next on the night. A Walmart now the site of a COVID-19 outbreak in Colorado. Health officials in El Paso County say 10 people have tested positive positive at one location. This isn't the first time another Walmart location in Colorado Springs reported 11 cases back in August. 
Walmart's corporate offices say they will continue to coordinate with the El Paso Public Health Authority to provide accurate information. Some illnesses have come to be associated with a stigma. Even decades after the HIV epidemic began, the issue around HIV may still exist. New findings suggesting racial and ethnic disparities among HIV infection rates. With more, here's ABC News' Andrew Dimbert. Men who have sex with men account for two-thirds of the yearly cases of HIV diagnosed in the United States. A concerning new report from the CDC explains in recent years, HIV infection rates among men who have sex with men have overall decreased, except for in the black, Hispanic, and Latino communities and younger population, males aged 13 to 19 years old. The study also finding these minority groups are less likely to receive the care that they need. Proper treatment for HIV allows patients to achieve viral suppression, which means there are low levels of the HIV virus in the body. When viral suppression occurs, people with HIV stay healthier and the chances of spreading the infection are much lower. Public health efforts need to encourage and help facilitate testing and treatment for these minority groups. If you have questions about HIV, want to get tested, or want to become a partner for HIV prevention, go online to the CDC website and check out the Let's Stop HIV Together campaign for more information. With this Medical Minute, I'm Andrew Dimber, ABC News. And a reminder, there's a flu shot drive this weekend. Our KSAT community partners are working with Bear County Precinct 2 Commissioner Justin Rodriguez to hold the drive this Saturday, October 10th. It's from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Nelson Wolf Stadium. Registration is required, and you can find out more information right now at ksatcommunity.com. All right, in your consumer news, Levi's is launching a denim buyback program. Customers drop off used jeans and denim jackets at participating Levi's stores and get a gift card in exchange. Those items are then to be cleaned and listed on the company's re-commerce website, Levi's Second Hand. According to Vogue, some of the clothing sold on Second Hand will be hand-picked vintage items, but most will come directly from Levi's customers. And there are recalls for you to uh, keep in mind some things you may have in your home, from ceiling fans to cell phone cases with batteries inside. Hundreds of thousands of these common products are flagged for safety reasons. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz with more, plus antifreeze poison alerts for parents. Tech troubles. 367,000 battery phone cases are recalled after users got burned. These are trianium battery phone cases by Endless and sold on Amazon for the past six years. 17 models are involved. These cases are for all types of cell phones. The lithium ion battery can overheat, causing thermal runaway. If this is your phone case, the company says stop using it and contact them for a free replacement. <laughs> Heads up for this ceiling fan. 280,000 Harbor Breeze Kingsbury models sold only at Lowe's are recalled. The manufacturer has 76 reports of the glass light globe falling and people have been injured. Owners are urged to contact the company for new installation instructions. <laughs> And poison alert if you have kids or pets around the garage. Prestone is recalling 687,000 gallons of antifreeze because the bottles may not be child resistant as required. The antifreeze was sold under six brands, Prestone, AutoZone, Highline, PrimeGuard, SuperTech, Prime and Starfire, widely sold this year. The company says inspect the product and be sure that that child resistant mechanism is engaged. We have more information on all of these recalls on our website. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Well, remember Stan the T-Rex? He's now found a forever home. The record breaking amount he brought in during auction. Coming up. Well, we just started the month of October, but it's not too early to celebrate Halloween. Because of the pandemic, it's important to celebrate safely. Our web team has put together a list of 10 ways to celebrate Halloween here at home while social distancing. There's also an interactive map when it comes to pumpkin patches that have popped up around town. It's all online right now on KSAT.com. All right, the sale of the world's most complete Tyrannosaurus Rex skeletons selling for a record amount on auction. He sold for 
$31.8 million. The skeleton is named after the man who found him, Stan. His skeleton was displayed at the Christie's Auction House flagship location in New York with, initial, with an initial estimate of six to eight million. Scientists have been studying him for the past two decades and now it's time for him to go to his forever home. Wow. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> A rare diamond hit the auction block selling for $15.7 million. The flawless 102 carat diamond was cut from a rough diamond discovered in Ontario, Canada in 2018. It's the first gem of its quality to be sold without a reserve, meaning that it would have been sold regardless of the size of the highest bid. Wow. I think I would rather have the dinosaur, though. <laughs> I, mean, I really would. I'll take the dinosaur. Yes. That's really cool. Amen to that. I agree. If only you could, like, fit it in the in foyer your of your yeah, home. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, where are you going to put it? <laughs> My kids would be thrilled. <laughs> You'd want to keep yeah. it, but no, not with that price tag, though. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyway, talk about a conversation piece, right? So looking ahead tomorrow, 70 in the morning, 88 in the afternoon, mixture of sun and clouds, a few showers east of San Antonio, closer to the Gulf Coast and along the coastal plain. So we're talking Hallettsville to, if you're lucky, Gonzales, down to Cuero, Goliad, Victoria. You'll have a few passing showers possible. But this weekend, we crank up the heat, sunny, and we'll be near 100 for a high temperature on Sunday. So mm. welcome back summer. No. <laughs> Just All for right. a bit, just for a bit. Yeah, thank you, Adam. <laughs> All right, that does it for the night. Don't forget, Good Morning San Antonio starts at 4.30. Good night.